So yeah, I'll be talking about NMR studies of gas absorption and giving a focus on carbon capture for some examples. So just to start off, I'll introduce you to the concept of adsorption and specifically gas adsorption. So in case you're not familiar, gas adsorption is the process where gas molecules adhere to a surface. So we can take this example of some CO2 gas with this solid surface here where the molecules adhere to the surface. And just to give you a little bit of language and um, some definitions here, we normally refer to the solid material that's doing the adsorption here as the adsorbent. The gas that binds to the surface, we call the adsorbate. And uh, you'll also hear me use the phrase adsorbed uh, gas. So why would we want to study this process of gas adsorption? Well, chemical separations currently consume around 10 to 15 percent of the world's energy. And a lot of these processes are traditional distillation uh, based separations. Adsorbent, sep adsorbent uh, based separations could enable much more um, energy efficient separation. And separations like carbon dioxide capture, for example, are becoming increasingly important due to the climate change crisis. Ultimately, through these NMR studies, we hope to get an improved understanding of adsorption processes that can aid materials design. So to give a specific example about CO2 capture, in case you're not familiar, here the idea is to capture CO2, the greenhouse gas, that's emitted in a number of industrial processes. So for example, we might have a cement or a steel factory, where currently we allow the CO2 to go into the atmosphere. The idea of carbon capture is to add an additional stage to the process where we capture the CO2, the greenhouse gas, and then we collect it and store it in the ground. And the, uh, one of the barriers to the widespread use of this technology is the cost of doing, the, of doing this process, where most of the cost comes from the chemical separation, the capture part. And so there's a lot of interest in making improved materials that can do carbon capture more efficiently. To give you an idea of how carbon capture works uh, on a basic level, we have an, a, a sponge-like material, which could be an adsorbent, and we pass through the mixture of gases and the sponge is selective so that only CO2 is absorbed by it. These other molecules that are not absorbed will pass on through out the chimney. And then we then regenerate the sponge. Um, we wring out the sponge, if you like, by applying energy through heat where we can collect pure carbon dioxide for storage. And so to give you an example of a carbon capture demonstration plant, that's that's operating at the moment. This is a cement uh, factory in Canada where they're using new adsorbent materials to capture the CO2 and prevent its emission to the atmosphere. So there's different types of adsorbent materials that we'll be covering today. And normally these are highly porous materials where the pores are classified by IUPAC um, according to this definition. So we have micro pores, which are pores with, with width of below two nanometers mesopores in the 2 to 50 nanometer range, and then macro pores, which are much larger pores, bigger than 50 nanometers. And the most common adsorbents um, are activated carbons, which are these disordered uh, porous carbon materials with graphitic-like local structures. Zeolites, which are these silicon and oxygen networks um, that also form a porous structure. And then also metal organic frameworks, which we'll focus on today, where we have metal ions that are, are cations that are bound together by organic anions that might be, for example, aromatic molecules. And these assemble together to make normally microporous um, adsorbent materials. And before we get to the NMR, how do people normally characterize these adsorbents? Well, what's normally done is gas adsorption measurements. So in these measurements, we quantify the amount of gas which can be absorbed by the material at different pressures, where the pressure is the, the driving force for adsorption. So for example, for a metal organic framework, a MOF, you can see the, the CO2 isotherm here, close to room temperature. And it tells you something about the quantity of gas that can be absorbed under different conditions. And you can also sometimes get information about the adsorbent structure from the isotherm. You can see this data is a, is a little bit lacking um, in, in information, perhaps. It doesn't really tell you too much about how the CO2 is absorbing, 
Um, how is the CA2 moving? How is it binding? And so we'd like to address this gap with NMR spectroscopy. Um, let me just hide this floating control. Okay. Yeah, so I will now give you an introduction to some of the methodology and some of the NMR hardware we might use when doing NMR studies of adsorption, and specifically with a focus on CO2. So when we think about CO2 and NMR, what kind of nuclei can we study? Well, we've got carbon-13 that jumps out immediately as, a, as a, maybe an obvious choice. This is a spin one half nucleus, so it's relatively straightforward to study, although the, the natural abundance is relatively low. There's also uh, the possibility to do oxygen 17 NMR here. Unlike carbon 13, we're now dealing with a quadrupolar nucleus where the spin is greater than the nuclear spin is greater than one half. And also the abundance is now um, very low. But fortunately, it's possible to enrich um, both of these isotopes both carbon-13 and 17 oxygen NMR, and this is commonly done um, in, the in the literature here. There's also, in the adsorbent itself, so in the solid material, there's also normally many other um, exciting NMR nuclei that we can look at. So just to give you one example, we might have an amine functionalized um, adsorbent material. So we could, for example, imagine doing nitrogen-15, um, proton NMR, and then there might be various other nuclei in the support like carbon-13, or maybe uh, 29 silicon for silicon-based materials. And they, those are all accessible with NMR too. But today we'll be focusing on NMR of these nuclei which are in the CO2 itself. Okay, so how do we actually make an NMR sample for studying gas adsorption? This is a little bit not obvious because we'd like to take this solid adsorbent material, which is porous, and we'd like to study the, the gas adsorption within it. So how could we make the NMR sample? Well, there's different uh, approaches that we can use here. And for an initial idea, we can think about either doing more gas or liquid state uh, NMR techniques, or maybe doing solid state NMR techniques. So with normal solution state NMR, we're used to having this NMR tube um, that we can fill with the sample. And there's no reason why we can't put solids in these tubes and then dose in the gas. But it's important to keep in mind for these measurements, the sample will be static. We can't do magic angle spinning. On the other hand, we could put our adsorbent into a rotor and do that with gas. And this is quite appealing because we can then spin the sample with magic angle spinning and get improved resolution. Um, so yeah, both of these techniques are possible for studying gas adsorption in solids. And which technique will be best will depend on the exact system. But I would say that the gas or liquid state uh, NMR kind of hardware will be better for systems where the adsorbed molecules are highly mobile. Um, so they might be weakly adsorbed molecules that we call fizzysorbed. So fizzysorbed means that the molecules are not bound covalently in the material, but they're weakly adsorbing through physical interactions. On the other hand, solid state NMR is very good for studying species that are highly immobilized. So, for example, if the adsorbed gas is chemically bonded uh, to the adsorbent, we'll call it chemisorbed. And then magic angle spinning here will be very useful in averaging anisotropic interactions and giving you nice narrow peaks. So Dr. Susie Pugh and I have recently written a short review on NMR studies of carbon dioxide capture. And in that review, we categorize the main approaches that have been used for studying gas absorption as follows. So don't worry, I'm going to walk you through each of these um, one at a time because there's a lot of information here. But broadly, A and B use magic angle spinning, whereas C and D use um, a static sample for the NMR measurement. And then on the left hand side here, going down the first column, A and C uh, use ex situ dosing of gas, which means we dose the sample away from the NMR spectrometer and then bring the sample to the spectrometer and, and measure the NMR. Whereas on the right hand column, we're talking about in situ NMR measurements. So in situ means in place. So meaning we dose the gas into the sample in place inside the NMR spectrometer. So let's go through A, B, C, and D one at a time. So the first one, which is very prevalent in the literature is this, what we call ex situ MAS. So we're doing magic angle spinning in a rotor and we're dosing the gas um, ex situ before sealing the sample and taking it uh, for NMR. 
The advantages of this approach are that MAS will improve resolution. We can quite easily use an isotopically enriched gases because normally we can introduce the gas in a system with a, a very small uh, volume. So it's not very costly to do these experiments. You can use normal solid state NMR um, probes for this, for this kind of experiment, which is a nice advantage. But one disadvantage is that it is quite time consuming to study different adsorption conditions. If you want to look at different pressures, for example, you'd have to go back and redose your sample each time. Just to show you one way, there's lots of ways you can do these measurements, but one way that, that we've worked on in particular is to have a gas manifold where you put your rotor inside with the adsorbent material and you, you uh, pull a vacuum on the whole system to remove any gas that's in there. And then you dose CO2 back in so that it can be absorbed by the material. And then we have a movable plunger um, which can move through an O-ring in a gas tight system where you then close the rotor at the end before taking it out for NMR measurements. And you can see lots of examples of these kinds of measurements um, in the literature. In the second approach, which is in situ MAS, we're again doing magic angle spinning, but now the gas is dosed into the sample in place. And this is something you see very rarely in the literature, um, but there's one nice study doing this, doing this recently, you can see down here. So here we're actually flowing gas into, um, into the probe, into the rotor through a hole, and then there'd also be a gas release out of the rotor. So the measurements are done under gas flow. Again, we've got magic angle spinning, so we can get good resolution. Um, and this is really a, a nice measurement because we're studying, we're studying adsorption as it happens or in situ. So we can see, for example, intermediate formation, we can see kinetics, and we can also vary the gas that we're flowing through quite readily. Um, and, and see what happens in the NMR. There are some downsides of this very nice approach though, which is that if you're flowing gas, it becomes very expensive to use enriched gases. Um, and also you do need these custom uh, rotors with, with the holes in the top. Um, ex situ static has a lot of similarities with the ex situ MAS, except now the sample is, um, is static, of course. So here we have normally a valved tube of some sort, where the adsorbent is in the tube, we can dose in gases into the tube and then close a tap and then take this tube to our solution state NMR spectrometer uh, and make measurements on it. A potential disadvantage is the sample will now, be, will now be static, so resolution may be limited in some cases. We can use enriched gases again because the volume of this system can be, can be kept very small and there's no need to flow any gas here. Um, and I've mentioned you can use normal NMR equi equipment but again, it will be time consuming to study different adsorption conditions because you need to take your sample back each time to your dosing manifold to, to, to vary the uh, conditions. And finally, the in situ static. Um, again, we'd have a gas delivery system uh, delivering gas in, into our NMR tube in situ. Again, the sample is static, so we might have resolution issues. We can use enriched gases if we don't flow in this setup. Um, but again, a disadvantage is you do need a custom NMR setup, and depending on who's in charge of the spectrometer, they may or not may or may not let you do these kinds of measurements. Um, and yeah, again, you can study all different kinds of adsorption conditions very readily. And there's a very nice example of studying mixed gas adsorption here from um, Ike Brunner's group. Okay, so that's just summarizing the methods, and we'll go through some different examples of, of how this can be done um, but with, with real examples. Just as a safety note, whenever you're doing experiments with gases, you need to be very careful with the gas handling. For example, with carbon dioxide, at low levels of sort of um, thousands of ppm, it can start to affect your health and, for example, make, make you drowsy. At much higher levels, it can potentially be fatal. So with, with these experiments, safety has to come first here. And especially for cases where you're flowing gas into the open environment. Okay, so for the next part, I'm going to do some short examples of how these methods can, can be applied before going on to some longer examples later. So we'll be focusing here on carbon-13 NMR studies of CO2 capture. And in all of the cases I'm about to show, the CO2 is enriched in carbon-13 um, at about 99% uh, carbon-13. Okay, but before we get to a specific example of gas adsorption, let's just go through the basic carbon NMR of just CO2 itself. 
If we have gaseous CO2, as you might expect, you get a very nice uh, narrow line and it comes at about 125 ppm. And this, this spectrum was measured uh, with a static um, NMR sample. Again, with a static NMR sample, we can look at solid CO2 or dry ice. And you can see now with the static sample, you get a significant chemical shift um, and isotropy. So what does that mean? Well, the NMR uh, chemical shift depends on the orientation of CO2 molecules um, in the sample relative to the applied magnetic field. And so on the left hand side, you've got the CO2 molecules that are perpendicular to the field. And on the right hand side, the CO2 molecules that are parallel to the field. And the physical origin of this is that the, the chemical shift arises from circulation of electrons in the orbitals. And it, and it depends on the, the orientation of these orbitals relative to the field. OK, so what should we expect for a gas absorbed in a solid uh, with a static sample? Well, we'll go through a few examples of that now. So for the first example, uh, this is an example of an ex situ static measurement. So here what we did is took activated carbon and put it into an NMR tube and then dosed carbon-13 labeled CO2 gas into the tube and then did static carbon-13 NMR. And this is what you get for that case. So you see you actually get a relatively narrow peak here at about 120 ppm. And we can assign this to CO2 that's absorbed in the pores of the activated carbon material, which has this disordered graphitic structure. Um, so what can we learn from this? Well, we can straight, quite straightforwardly integrate this peak and learn how much CO2 is absorbed in the material for a given condition. But what we can also learn is, because we see this very narrow peak, it's similar to what we saw before for CO2 gas rather than for CO2 uh, solid, which has the anisotropic line shape. So this tells us that on average, CO2 in the carbon pores rotates isotropically. Or put another way, the CO2 has no preferred orientation um, in the sample. Interestingly, we see that the adsorbed CO2 signature is also shifted away from the free CO2 shift. Uh, and this chemical shift difference actually arises from a ring current effect, which is where in these aromatic carbons, high electrons can circulate around in the magnetic field and shield uh, nearby nuclei. So we also can get some information about the absorbent structure itself here um, from the NMR of CO2. Okay, let's go through another example now. So now we're doing this very similar measurement. It's a static measurement again in an NMR tube. But instead of looking at carbon, we're now looking at a metal organic framework material. So it's this so-called zinc DOBDC, where you've got the zinc ions in blue, and these organic molecules are shown um, in gray, and you have these hexagonal pores of the pore size of, of about one nanometer with the pores running into the screen. Okay, so again, we can dose CO2 in here, and this time I've actually got a photograph for you. So you can see we've got a very large number of crystallites um, stuffed inside the NMR tube here, and then the NMR tube has a valve where we can introduce the CO2. And then we've again done a static um, carbon-13 NMR measurement. You see it's different from when we looked at the activated carbon. We no longer see a nice narrow resonance. And instead, we see something reminiscent of the, the solid CO2. So the chemical shift now is anisotropic. Although the magnitude um, or the, the width of this spectrum is much smaller than what you see for solid CO2. So it tells us something about the orientation of CO2 in the moth. And it tells us that the CO2 is mobile and rotating around inside the moth pores, but not isotropically. And the CO2 has some average orientation um, inside the moth pore network. Um, I'll give you a similar example now to drive a few of these points home. So this is also a, a moth sample, but on a, on a different kind of moth, uh, where we've got these layers in the material that are bridged by these nitrogen-containing organic molecules. Again, it's a st an ex situ static measurement. So the moth is in a tube and we dose some gas in. What was really cool is that in this study, they had large single crystals. And so they could actually do measurements where they take a single crystal of the moth with CO2 inside it and change the orientation of the crystal. And you can see the, the main signature here shifting um, as a function of the orientation of the single crystal, which just um, drives home that point again that the CO2 has some 
preferred orientation uh, relative to the moth structure. This little peak here is just coming from a small amount of free CO2 in the sample. And then if you do a powder sample, you obviously have a, a distribution of, of orientations of the crystal. And then this is what they recovered um, in this work. So you now see the experimental, what we'd call the powder pattern, which is effectively a histogram of the crystal orientations. You can see now how these measurements can start to be used to study dynamics because we have different NMR signatures depending on the orientation of the crystal. So they did a really nice experiment in this work where they put four single crystals inside an NMR tube with random uh, different orientations. And then they did an exchange spectroscopy 2D NMR experiment. So in the first experiment here in part A, they use a very low mixing time, which means there's not much time for CO2 to move uh, between crystals. Um, so the CO2 will mostly remain in the crystal um, that it's in initially uh, during the NMR experiment. And so you see on the diagonal, the signals from CO2 that didn't exchange. So this is CO2 in, in one particular single crystal, and this is CO2 in, a, in another particular crystal with a different orientation uh, and so on. And as the mixing time is increased, you can start to see now cross peaks, which tell you that exchange is occurring, where CO2 is actually moving between um, different crystals in the sample. OK, and we'll talk a bit more about another measurement that can be used to look at dynamics um, and diffusion of CO2 using these methods. So to give a, a final quick example before we do some, some deeper dives, um, I'd like to talk about an, an example of an ex situ magic angle spinning uh, measurement. So here we took an amine functionalized metal organic framework and dosed it with carbon dioxide gas inside this special dosing apparatus where we closed the rotor um, following a period of time where the CO2 is allowed to absorb in the sample. And we then again went to carbon-13 NMR, but now using magic angle spinning conditions. And you can see for the simplest NMR experiments, so a pulse acquire or a one pulse direct excitation, you can now see two different peaks for CO2 in the sample. So at 125 ppm, which is very similar to the shift of the free gas that I showed you earlier, we have weakly absorbed or fizzy-sorbed CO2 that's physically um, interacting with the moth structure. But then we have this interesting new resonance above 160 ppm, which comes from CO2 that's now chemically um, chem chemically absorbed in the material. So there's been a bond formed to the CO2. And practically, when you do these measurements, you normally use cross polarization, transferring magnetization from um, 1H to 13C. And that enables us to pulse much faster and accumulate data more quickly because of the shorter relaxation time T1, F for protons. But you can see the cross polarization also gives you some selectivity because we no longer see the fizzy sort of CO2. And that's because the CP relies on, on dipole dipole couplings, which are, are largely not present uh, for the fizzy sort of CO2. OK, so we're now going to do a deeper dive, um, so a more extended example on using pulse field gradient NMR to probe anisotropic CO2 diffusion in these metal organic frameworks. Um, so before I get into the data on that, though, I'd just like to give you a quick introduction to pulsed field gradient NMR. Um, the books from Paul, Paul Callahan are a great resource here, um, and I'll give you a quick introduction. So the general measurement scheme of pulsed field gradient NMR is to have a period where you encode the positions of the spins in the sample. You then allow some time to pass, which we call the diffusion time, during which time the molecules and therefore the spins uh, move around in the sample. We then decode the position of the spins um, and then finally read out the signal. Um, and the way the encoding of the position of spins is done is with a magnetic field gradient. So in the absence of a field gradient, we're used to this equation that the Lamo frequency um, is equal to effectively the gyromagnetic ratio times the magnetic field strength. And I've omitted a, a minus sign here, sorry about that. Um, when we apply a gradient, the Lamo frequency now depends on the position of the spins in the sample. So if we apply a constant gradient, the Lamo frequency will now be given by this equation where we've replaced B, B0 with um, B0 plus this gradient term where Z will be the position 
of the spins in the z direction and then db by dz um, is a constant value uh, which is the gradient strength so if you imagine an nmr tube for example filled with um, a fluid um, you can see that the, the, the magnetic field will be maybe slightly stronger at the top because of the field gradient and it will be slightly weaker um, at the bottom of the sample and um, so you can see how now the nmr frequency will depend on on where you are in the sample so then in the pfg nmr experiment the idea is as follows what we do is we prepare some magnetization in the xy plane if we use a use a vector model here and we first encode the position of the spins by applying a pulse of the uh, magnetic field gradient so if we look down here um, at the situation before we've applied that enco encoding pulse all of the uh, all of the spins in the sample or all of the regions of different regions of magnetization will have the same things and then after the magnetic field gradient pulse depending on where you were in the sample you would have developed uh, the spins would have developed different uh, different phase for the case where there's no motion um, at all and all of these um, spins stay where they are we can then perfectly undo this encoding of the position of the spins by applying a reverse pulse where we decode the position of the spins and this will bring all of the magnetization back in phase and give us a nice strong um, nmr signal in reality obviously uh, the spins will move and so you ha you'll have some some uh, some diffusion of the spins so that they, they move to different regions within the sample and now when we do our decoding pulse everything's moved so the, the refocusing is messed up and now the spins will not come come back into coherence the, mag the magnetization will effectively cancel out to some extent and you'll get a reduced nmr signal and um, from this destructive interference so the way that we then do the experiment is to apply a series of, of, of gradient pulses where we we vary the magnitude of the gradient pulse and it turns out the nmr signal depends on quite a few different parameters here and it uh, practically it's convenient to fix all of these apart from the gradient the gradient pulse strength so we're going to vary the g the gradient pulse um, strength and then eventually fit the data for d which is the self-diffusion coefficient that we're interested in so yeah we do, do a first experiment with a very small or zero gradient uh, we then apply a slightly longer uh, a slightly sorry stronger gradient pulse of the same duration and the nmr signal will reduce slightly and then we apply a stronger gradient sit still and the NMR signal decreases further um, and normally this diffusion time it will be fixed to some value say 10 or 20 milliseconds okay and then you can then fit the data using an exponential function um, where the only unknown is the self-diffusion coefficient d so you can see you'll, you'll, you'll get some some data like this and if the diffusion is faster for a given species you'll see a more rapid uh, decay in the NMR experiment. And then you can, you can realize that there's a faster or a larger value of, of the self-diffusion coefficient. So let's look at a, an example of how these measurements are then used to study diffusion. I'm gonna focus on this particular metal organic framework here that I introduced earlier, the zinc DOBDC, um, which has these hexagonal pores of around one nanometer um, width. In principle, the CO2 diffusion should be very anisotropic here, meaning the diffusion will be quite different in different directions within the material, because you've got a nice, easy direction where things, where CO2 can move along the pores, but then a, a much more difficult direction where CO2 would struggle to move between pores. Um, and this is quite important for practical application, because if we're doing CO2 capture, we want to get the CO2 in and out as fast as we can. Um, so that the process can run can run rapidly so this is important to understand so just a reminder this links back to one of the quick examples earlier that we're doing this ex situ static measurement here where we're dosing co2 in to a powder of crystallite and that the nmr spectrum for the adsorbed co2 which is, is weakly adsorbed in the pores here corresponds to a, effectively a histogram of crystal orientations so on the left hand side you've got the co2 that's in crystals that are roughly parallel with the applied magnetic field and on the right hand side you've got co2 in crystallites that are perpendicular to the magnetic field and you have everything else um, in between 
Just a few practical points. Here we were really interested uh, to measure the diffusion of CO2 within the MOF crystals. Um, and what you need to realize is in the pulse field gradient NMR experiment, what we actually measure is the effective diffusion over a time period of 10 to 100 milliseconds, which is set in the experiment as the diffusion time. So it turns out you actually need quite big crystals if you want to measure CO2 diffusion within the crystals. Because otherwise, if you have small crystals, CO2 will be hopping out um, and going into different, different crystals in the sample, like we saw earlier. If you're really, measure, you're really interested in measuring the CO2 diffusion within the crystals, then you need very large crystals here. Another important point is that when we do this self-diffusion measurement, we're only sensitive to diffusion in the direction of the magnetic field gradient, um, shown here by this arrow. This is normally um, in the same direction as the main magnetic field, so up uh, in the laboratory frame or along Z. Okay, so when we do the pulse field gradient NMR measurement, we basically do a series of a series of experiments where we increase the magnetic field gradient. We see some really uh, interesting behavior where you can see uh, the decay of the NMR signal, which remember tells you uh, about the diffusion, is quite different depending on where you are in this line shape. So on the left-hand side of the spectrum, we have the crystals that are parallel with the applied field and field gradient. And here we see a rapid decay of the NMR signal with the field gradient, which means diffusion is rapid. And it turns out what we're looking at here is the diffusion of CO2 along the pores um, of the metal organic framework. In contrast, on the right hand side of the spectrum, where we're looking now at CO2 and crystallites that are perpendicular to the applied field, which in turn means we're, we're sensitive to CO2 diffusion between pores or in this kind of XY direction. Um, we now see a much more, yeah, much slower decay, which tells us that this diffusion in this and in this direction is is much much slower than in the other direction, as we might expect. Um, so from 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 this paper, we were inspired from from the Stalmark uh, lab, where they they showed that you can simulate these kinds of things in MOFs, and we we adopted a similar simulation method, where you can simulate the uh, experimental NMR, which is shown on the left, with um, a simulation here with code written in MATLAB on, on the right, uh, where the only three parameters are the diffusion values in the two different directions in the material parallel to the pores and perpendicular to the pores. And you can see we get a uh, pretty good agreement between the simulation and um, experiment here. And what we were ultimately able to conclude here as the final result for this project was the diffusion of CO2 parallel to the MOF pores takes a value of about one times 10 to the minus nine meters squared per second. So to give that some context, for gas phase CO2, the value is about 10 to the minus five. So about 10 times. So we have a slowing down of diffusion of about 10,000 times relative to the gas when we're inside the material. And this diffusion is also similar to bulk water diffusion um, as a liquid at room temperature. Interestingly, we see the diffusion between pores now. Uh, it takes a value of less than 1 times 10 to the minus 13 meters squared per second. And in this particular case, we weren't able to conclude um, whether, the, whether the value of, of the diffusion coefficient was non-zero or not, but we could say it's less than 10 to the minus 13. So you can see the anisotropy here, or the ratio of these two diffusion coefficients, has a value of more than 10,000. Uh, 10, so the CO2 can move sort of um, it will make progress about 10,000 times faster, uh, you know, along the pores than it will uh, between pores. And this is quite interesting for understanding adsorption in these materials because it's often found the, the amount of CO2 that they can absorb um, is a little bit less than what you might imagine. And we think that's because if you have a defect or a, a blockage um, in the pore, regions of the material may become completely inaccessible. And so you have a, a loss of capacity. And that can also give you some ideas about how to modify the materials in the future. Okay, so that concludes that part. And I'll just switch to a final deep dive now about using magic angle spinning NMR to understand CO2 binding mechanisms in amine functionalized MOFs. So working with a similar family of metal organic frameworks from what I showed you earlier, we can make uh, an analog of the one I showed earlier, but with um, 
two fennel rings now in the organic ligand. And overall, this makes the pore a bit bigger with a size of around uh, two nanometers. And there's now actually space that you can functionalize uh, the, the metal organic framework with amines. So what you have is these metal ions in the moth, which have a vacant coordination site to complete the octahedron, and you can functionalize this with amines. And so what, what's been done in, in the long lab at Berkeley is to put in different diamine molecules in particular. And you can basically dunk them off in a solution of diamines, and then you end up with, if you're careful, with one diamine per metal site. So they're not shown here, but this moth pore will be densely packed with amine molecules. And it's quite easy to vary the, the particular amine that you put in, so you can quite rapidly generate different adsorbent materials with different properties. Interestingly, these amine functionalized moths have quite different CO2 um, adsorption isotherms from what I showed you earlier. Rather than seeing a gradual uptake, what we see here is a step-shaped absorption of CO2. So a low pressure CO2 doesn't want to absorb in the material at all until a certain pressure where suddenly adsorption becomes very favorable and the material rapidly saturates. This is quite interesting from a practical uh, application standpoint because we can quite easily switch on and off the adsorption with a low um, energy barrier. Um, and at the same time, this step-shaped isotherm indicates that there's something very interesting going on here with the CO2 adsorption mechanism. It suggests there's some cooperativity, meaning once some CO2 starts to bind, subsequent CO2 molecules can bind more easily. And the proposed mechanism for this cooperative CO2 adsorption is as follows. If we take a look at the MOF structure and we look down for a long vertex here, what we actually have is a chain of metal ions about seven angstroms apart, and each one will have a diamine molecule uh, bound to it. The hypothesis is that when CO2 comes in, it inserts in between the metal and the amine bond, and you form this negative species called carbamate. At the same time, a proton is transferred, so the dangling amine to make positively charged ammonium. And the ammonium, and the, the ammonium can then interact with a neighboring carbamate species through iron pairing interactions as well as hydrogen bonding. And so what you get eventually is, are these chains, and this helps to explain um, the cooperativity and the step shape by them. So this was a hypothesis, and it's been verified with single crystal diffraction experiments for zinc-based metal organic frameworks. But one issue that we ran into was that the single crystal diffraction was not possible on the magnesium analogs of the MOS, which had better performance um, for CO2 capture applications. So we were interested to develop the, the NMR methods to then study the adsorption chemistry in these, in these amine functionalized MOS. So again, this is an example of using ex situ MAS. So we, we prepare the material in the rotor, do CO2, and then seal the rotor inside the gas manifold and then take it for solid state NMR. And immediately you can see the chemisorbed CO2 peak when you do carbon-13 NMR, which tells us that CO2 has indeed uh, reacted chemically with an amine inside the MOF structure. You can then do 2D NMR experiments to get a more uh, a, a sort of a more detailed picture of what's going on here. So this is a HECWAR experiment where we've done a 2D where magnetization is transferred from proton to carbon by cross polarization. And we've used a short contact time in the experiment here. So any correlation you see comes from correlations of 1H and 13C nuclei that are close together in space. So you see this NH, uh, C correlation, which comes from um, the carbamate group. But more interestingly, we see a weak correlation for a highly shifted proton species, which we think is um, a hydrogen bonded ammonium species. So this supports the formation of an ammonium carbamate chain. And you can see we also do DFT calculations of the chemical shifts here um, for, the, for the structure that we think is forming. And this helps to corroborate the mechanism. Uh, we then done these measurements on a wider range of materials where we keep them off the same but vary the amine. We found for a large number of amines, um, including polyamines, the ammonium carbonate chain mechanism um, is dominant. Um, we, we ran into some quite interesting results when, when colleagues at Berkeley, so this is work from Phil Milner, were looking for an optimized material capturing CO2 from flue gas. 
So flue gas will have a typical CO2 level of about 150 millibar CO2. And the target is to capture at least 90% of that CO2. So what we would like is a material that can capture down to basically 10% of this pressure. So what we would like is our material to have its absorption step right here at 15 millibar. Uh, but the materials that, that were being examined at Berkeley at the time fell into two categories. So some types of amine functionalized MOFs had their step pressure too high. So these don't bind CO2 strongly enough um, to capture 90% CO2 from the stream. And on the other hand, other materials with other types of uh, diamines had the step pressure in a too low of a pressure, which means they can capture at least 90% of the CO2 from the gas stream. But the CO2 is bound so strongly that there'll be a very large energy cost to then regenerate the material and collect the CO2 off of it. Um, but eventually, Phil discovered a particular diamine shown here, this DMPN uh, diamine, which had the absorption step pretty much in the right spot um, for this flue gas. Um, so this was quite promising. But, but interestingly, we noticed that the absorption step was less sharp than what we'd seen previously with possibly multiple processes occurring. So we hypothesized that the mechanism has actually changed. The CO2 absorption mechanism has changed in this material. So applying our NMR methods, we looked at some of the, the sort of the benchmark materials that form ammonium carbonate. In all of these cases, we see one peak for the chemisorbed CO2 forming carbonate. But for our new material now that looks promising for flue gas, we see two main peaks in a one-to-one -one ratio. So there's a change in, in, in the chemisorption mechanism here. Um, eventually, collaborators doing density functional theory came up with a proposed um, structure that could fit the NMR observations. So let me walk you through the proposed structure for what's going on here. The hypothesis is that in one, uh, in one chain of metal ions in the material, you have the traditional mechanism that I've described, where you have the negative carbamate species and the ammoniums, and they form these iron parent uh, chains. But then in an adjacent chain of metal ions, uh, we have a different mechanism going on, where CO2 is now reacted with the terminal amine, so not the metal bound side. And instead of having a charged species, we now have a neutral um, carbamic acid species. So it's similar to a carboxy carboxylic acid, except you've got an amine there. So it's called a carbamic acid. And the, the idea was that these stabilize each other through hydrogen bonding interactions. So we looked at the proton and carbon NMR parameters for this mechanism uh, from the HECOR experiments. And then there was a number of interesting um, key resonances which seemed to fit uh, broadly with, with the 1H and the 13C NMR parameters. So this was uh, supported um, in this study here. But it was a little bit unclear, you know, how, how confident can we be of this highly complicated mechanism? Is this really happening? So we wanted to go a bit further. Uh, some more detail. Yeah. One of the issues we ran into is, is well, carbon-13 is very easy to do, um, carbon-13 NMR, but it actually provides quite poor differentiation between carbamic acid, which is this neutral um, acid species, and the negative um, uh, ammonium carbamate species. So these are DFT calculated carbon chemical shifts for different structures. And you can see there's a, a significant overlap of the calculated shifts. So this is not, 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 not the best probe um, of this chemistry. Um, but fortunately, the DFT calculations give you all of the NMR parameters, not just the ones that you're interested in at the time. And Astrid from our group in Cambridge looked into this in detail and found that actually oxygen-17 NMR is potentially a very powerful probe of CO2 chemisorption. Um, the oxygen-17 is interesting for a number of reasons, but first off, you've got two chemical environments for um, a CO2 here, assuming you've broken the symmetry. So there's already a double doubling of the information uh, possible there. Also, when we do magic angle spinning of oxygen-17, we don't just get the isotropic chemical shift. But we also get the quadrupolar NMR parameters and specifically the, the CQ parameter, which is plotted here, which is a measure of the magnitude um, of the electric field gradient. And we also get the asymmetry parameter, um, which is not shown here. So 
going from the isotropic carbon chemical shift to the oxygen 17, we have a doubling, but then also a, a times times three in terms of the NMR parameters from the quadrupole parameters. So we then get six times um, the amount of information. And excitingly, the, the calculations showed that the carbamic acid oxygen, so shown up here, this oxygen that's got a hydrogen attached, has uh, these kinds of um, oxygens have quite different NMR parameters from all of the other oxygens, where they're characterized by low isotropic chemical shifts, as well as large um, CQ values and also low asymmetry values, which is not shown here. So to test this idea, we set off on doing oxygen 17 NMR experiments. And this is work led by um, Dr. Susie Pugh and also with Marion Shaw on the synthesis um, of these materials. So first off, we went for a material where we were pretty sure we knew what was going on. So we took a material that should form uh, the ammonium carbamate chain mechanism. And as I said, there's two different oxygen environments here. And that's exactly what we see in the oxygen 17 NMR experiment. So there's two different oxygen environments. And if you're not used to looking at these magic angle spinning experiments on, on quadrupolar nuclei, the magic angle spinning can't completely average the quadrupolar interaction. And so the second order interaction is partly uh, retained in the NMR spectrum. So we have these um, unusual NMR line shapes. Um, just a comment on, on the, you might be wondering how easy is this to do? Um, how easy is this experiment? We've used 20% 17 oxygen enriched um, CO2 here, which we, which we purchased. The measurement does require high field to get good resolution. So this was done on an 850 megahertz um, system. So that's the proton frequency. And then the experiment time here was about one hour. The, the cost of enriched gas here would come, out, come in at about 50 pounds, uh, which nowadays is about $50 uh, US as well. Um, so we can fit this line shape and get, I mentioned that you get six times the information. So here are the six NMR parameters. So for each site, we've got the oxygen 17 isotropic chemical shift, the CQ, which is like the magnitude of the, the electric field gradient, and then the asymmetry. So how different the field gradient is in different directions. And the experimental value comes first, and then the DFT value comes in brackets. And you can see now we've got six NMR parameters, all with reasonable agreement between experiment and DFT. And so now we can really confidently say, yes, actually, we are forming these ammonium carbonate chains, and they're very well supported by the Oxygen 17 experiments. So we went then as, for the final part of this project, and before I wrap up, we wanted to go back to our, our promising material for flue gas capture, where we were claiming earlier that there's this mixed mechanism of carbonates um, and carbamic acids. So now we should actually see four different oxygen environments in the NMR spectrum. And indeed, we do see uh, evidence for four environments here. I didn't mention the, the sharp signals earlier. That just comes from physically absorbed CO2 in the material and um, that we're less interested in here. OK, and we'll talk about this fit in a minute because you might be wondering how, how unique is this fit. Um, but importantly, what we see now is this, this resonance at low chemical shift um, with a lower asymmetry value as well. And this gives us really concrete evidence for the carbamic acid OH species, which is often quite sort of controversial or challenging to assign in the NMR spectra. So again, now for this mechanism, we've actually got 12 um, different NMR parameters, four chemical shifts, four CQs, and then four uh, asymmetry parameters. And all of these have reasonable agreement. And I just want to highlight, yeah, again, the carbamic acid OH resonance with its low chemical shift and low asymmetry value finally gives us more concrete evidence for, for this new mechanism um, to be operating. But to get confidence in the NMR parameters, actually what you really want to do, this was at 850 megahertz, but these spectra get a lot better if you can go to even slightly higher magnetic fields. And so with the gigahertz um, spectrometer that's come online at Warwick um, last year, we've now been able to get better resolution in these experiments. And now you can see the OH resonance really starting to be resolved. Uh, and when we do the NMR, um, when we do the fits for these different um, spectra, we can do a multi-field fit, which gives us more confidence in our NMR parameters. And so that's what we've done um, in this study. Okay, so yeah, I think I'll just conclude there. And 
well, the concluding point on this is um, with these new NMR methods, we can we can really uncover these new adsorption uh, chemistries, which can help to explain um, promising performance for gas separations. So ultimately, this mixed uh, adsorption mechanism seems to favour uh, intermediate CO2 capture strength, which is what we need for that 15% flue gas. So yeah, just to summarise, hopefully I've shown that NMR is a powerful probe of gas adsorption. There's a range of experimental approaches that are possible with standard NMR equipment, although you do need to you know, tinker a little bit and build some, some gas dosing setups. You can get information on dynamics and diffusion, as well as the binding modes and speciation of the adsorbed molecules. Um, in terms of outlook for the future, there is a need for more studies under realistic conditions. Everything I've shown you today was under pure CO2 conditions. And so, you know, not fully representative of a gas separation process where other molecules like water vapor will be, will be present. Studies of gas mixtures are in fact relatively rare um, and should be uh, another interesting area for development. And then as we have these hardware developments in NMR, like increasingly high magnetic fields, faster magic angle spinning and potentially hyperpolarization, all of these will enable new NMR experiments to study gas auction. And so with that, I'll just finish and thank all of the, fund the funders and also the, the collaborators and importantly, the, the researchers in my group who led, led the study here on, on the Oxygen 17. So in particular, Astrid uh, and Susie and Marion, and then also Ben and Zugas and, and Vigrang in our group have been doing uh, NMR experiments I've not shown today, but sort of ongoing in our lab. So I'll just finish there and I'll, I'll, I'll also just quickly, a quick adv advertisement that we'll have a postdoc position coming up in summer uh, 2023 um, for some, for some uh, NMR work. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave it there and thank you for, for listening. Uh, thank you very much. That was really interesting, some very satisfying experiments. So uh, yeah, please put your, your questions in the Q&A. Um, we've already got some questions, so uh, I'll jump right in. Um, so Dominic has, has asked uh, a range of questions. So his first question is uh, your your ex situ MAS the apparatus um, is it commercial and and if not how easy is it to to construct? Yeah, uh, it's not commercial. So this is the apparatus I think that's being mentioned. Yeah. Um, so no, it's not commercial. Um, but I will say it is relatively cheap to construct. Um, of the so in terms of equipment, cheap as equipment goes, so we're talking maybe a thousand dollars to make a setup like this, which is not bad given the capabilities it can give you. Um, I'm happy to talk to people about how to, to, to make these systems. It's basically just plumbing um, and happy to share insights on that. Um, Okay, great. Uh, a kind of related question for the in-situ version where you you had holes in the caps. Again, is this commercial or have you kind of drilled a hole in, in the rotor caps? Uh, exa exactly yeah, how so does that work? This work's very, yeah, so this um, this work is not, not, not my own work. And um, this is work from uh, Muslim Voyashkin. Um, so you can check out this paper for the full details. But it's a, a custom rotor and I don't know exactly how they made it, but it sort of seems like they did drill some holes in into the rotor and then they inserted a special sort of gas hose that could both allow gas to go in and also uh, allow gas to come back out again. Okay, great. And uh, uh, just to um, mention that uh, Fred Perez left us a, a comment that Phoenix NMR can sell uh, does sell MAS rotors with gas valves. So uh, that's a, uh, another option for high pressure um, gas. Maybe I can comment on that as well. Yeah, so for all of these measurements, we normally work close to ambient pressure or below. Mm -hmm. If you put, a very, you know, you don't want to put a very high pressure of some, some gas in the rotor um, and then take it out of this setup and spin it in your solid state NMR probe because the cap will probably come flying off. Also, you do have to be a bit careful of that because the, the sample will heat up from frictional mm -hmm. heating so that will actually potentially trigger some gas desorption if you don't control the temperature so again this can be can be a very good way to damage your equipment so i have to ask has that happened have you had kind of a gas induced rotor crashes no but i've been quite careful so far okay. Okay. Um, but that's um, good 
a safe technique if you're careful then. But just to be clear about what Fred's talking about in the chat, um, yeah, you can get these really fancy rotors which have this check valve, which is like a one-way valve. So if you put the rotor in a very high pressure environment, like say 50 bar, which is 50 times atmospheric pressure roughly, gas will go into the rotor one way, but then it will stay in there and it won't come out because this is like a one-way valve. So that that's um you need specialist rotors for that, that, that are commercial. Okay, cool. Thanks for the clarification on the hardware there. Uh, a question now, again from Dominic, about the uh, relaxation. So um, what is the uh, carbon-13 T1 for gaseous CO2 and the mechanism, if you know it, is it spin rotation and then related? How does it change when you have this absorbed uh, CO2? Is the, have you done any kind of relaxometry? Is that another handle you can use apart from the, the shift? Yeah, I've not talked about relaxation measurements at all. And if you do go into the literature, there are studies where they look at this and you can measure relaxation as a function of, of gas pressure and temperature and get a lot of in insight into dynamics. Um, so I've not studied this in detail, Dominic, but I recall in the metal organic frameworks, um, in those studies I showed, uh, the T1s ended up being around a second, which is actually kind of just what you want for doing pulse field gradient NMR. It's very, it's very convenient because you don't have to wait too long, but also you don't have fast relaxation during the PFG experiment. Um, when you look at free gas, I remember doing this, I think once, the T1 was very, very short. I think it was about 20 milliseconds, and I believe it is a spin uh, rotation mechanism. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, okay, so next question um, is from uh, Eddie Dibb, who asks, uh, do you get any carbon-13 enrichment of the absorbent surface after introducing carbon-labeled CO2? Is there any kind of exchange? Um, it's a good question. We've I suspect there will be, and especially for potentially defect sites in the material. So normally these moths don't have many react, don't have sort of reactive groups in their backbone. If you did have defects, they could potentially react with CO2 and exchange some carbon-13 spins. But what we have found with our oxygen-17 NMR work, which is sort of ongoing, the oxygen-17s are a bit more promiscuous, and you know they'll readily um, exchange. Um, and we've, we've seen evidence for some enrichment in some of the materials we've looked at with 17 oxygen. Okay, interesting. So maybe maybe a cool new method to enrich materials in, in, <laughs> in a bit itself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so another kind of hardware question. For the uh, O17 NMR you showed at the end, what uh, rotor size was uh, were you using? And were you able to kind of extend those experiments to MQMAS, or is it uh, kind of limited to the 1D? Um. Yeah, so the 17 oxygen experiments we've done so far have been recorded in either, let me just try and pull one up. Well, I guess here's one. Um, they've either been in 3.2 millimeter rotors or four millimeter rotors, mm -hmm. where we're generally going for sort of big samples as far yeah. as we can to enhance the signal. Um, so Susie was able to record, uh, and Ben um, have, have recorded some MQMAS spectra. Um, well, the experiment time there is relatively long, um, of the order of days. So it's mm -hmm. not it's not like we can just sort of do them on lots of different materials. But okay. the MQMAS have 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 uh, spectra have helped to support some of the assignments that I've shown today. Okay. Um, Great. Yeah. And it, would there be any advantage to spinning faster? Or uh, I mean, your sidebands seem kind of resolved here. So no, I think the biggest benefit for us will be to go to higher still magnetic field like yeah. in terms of changing the hardware i think the 3.2 or 4 millimeter is what you want and um we just want higher field uh it was you know really clear seeing the um the change from 850 to 1 gigahertz really resolving that site so that was nice to see okay uh a question now from ping Yu. um so talking about uh the mas so your um uh, absorbed CO2 experiments, the in-situ, um, sorry, the ex-situ MES, what rotor size and how fast are you spinning for those sort of experiments? Um, yes, yeah, so I think, I can't remember the exact details, but we were using 3.2 millimeter on the gigahertz and four millimeter on the 850. Mm -hmm. and I think the sample spinning speeds were therefore slightly different. I think four millimeter, we're normally about 12.5 kilohertz MES or something like that. 
and probably with 3.2 we're a bit faster than that um yeah. okay uh, and another question from um, ping which is also a question i had uh what software were you using to fit those spectra and in particular when you were doing multi-field fits were they truly simultaneous or were they kind of pseudo simultaneous going back and forth uh, I believe these were truly simultaneous. Done, so these were done by um, Astrid. Um, and we used some new software that came out, I think, a year or two ago. I forget the exact name. It's something like SS uh, Snake or something. Yeah, yeah. SS so, Snake or S Snake. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I think that, that software we, f we found was really uh, helpful for that project. Um, yeah, it's worth checking that out if you've not, not used it for the multi field fit. Yeah, uh, yeah, pretty convincing fits, I would say. Uh, okay, so question from uh, Ying Tang: uh, How did you prepare the single crystal MOF samples? Um, and did you do any MAS uh, experiments on the single crystals, um, or did you have a problem with voids? Um, let's see. So I don't know if we're if you're talking about this measurement. I guess. So yeah, this definitely wasn't MES. Yeah, so this is yeah, so this is without MES. Um but yeah, you do have voids here, but we're not spinning in this case, so we're, we're we don't we don't worry about that. But um if the question is about sort of spinning stability, in the case where we do the magic angle spinning experiments, we do densely pack the sample. So we we're not actually spinning single crystals, but rather spinning powders mm -hmm. of crystallites. You can, I didn't show it, but you can spin these kinds of samples as well, where you have quite large crystallites or even crystals, and you can recover the isotropic shift. Um, it's doable, but the stability of the spinning might, might be questionable. Okay. Uh, okay, so, uh... Anyone else has any questions? Do stick them in in the Q and A. Um, I had a couple of questions. You mentioned uh, you needed sufficiently big crystals when you're doing the PFG experiments, um, so that uh, you're actually measuring the diffusion inside the crystal, not outside. Uh, how how do you really tell if you're measuring kind of in the diffusion in or out the the crystal? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... In this case, we, we have these quite nice um, line shapes, right? And the NMR line shape is different if it's absorbed versus if it's free. Actually, at these conditions where the CO2 pressure is relatively low, um, because gases are very dilute, there's actually a relatively low amount of CO2 in the gas phase of the sample. And it's really being concentrated significantly in uh, in the moth. So the first sort of I, we can't definitively say there's no contribution from exchange, um, but we can say there's no obvious signal from pre CO two gas here, which would come at around one twenty five ppm. We also do tests where we do exchange spectroscopy um, two D like two D XE. and we we measure the characteristic exchange time scales for CO two to move between different crystallites, which corresponds to different parts of the powder pattern. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, you find you need sort of hundreds of milliseconds before that exchange is apparent. So then you can set your diffusion time to be short relative okay. to that characteristic exchange time scale. That so we sense. think it's it's largely um, negated in these measurements. So a related question, uh, you put kind of a upper limit on the diffusion um, between uh, channels. What kind of uh, what determines what your kind of limit of sensitivity is here? Yes. So to measure slower and slower diffusion, let's go back to the equation. Um, to measure very slow diffusion, you can see. So I've got larger d going this way. If you have smaller d, eventually the signal will just not change as a function of the gradient. So what limits you is how strong your gradient can be, which is limited by the hardware. Like the strongest we can normally get is around 17 Tesla per meter, or maybe with custom probes, you can get like 30 Tesla per meter. It does also depend on, on uh, the duration of the gradient pulses, which sort of depends on 
uh, the probe, you have to be a bit careful not to fry the probe by applying them for too long. Mm-hmm. And also the gyromagnetic ratio um, and the diffusion time. So yeah, you'll be able to measure slower diffusion for nuclei with larger um, gyromagnetic ratios. This diffusion time also, if you can make that very long, mm-hmm. and you can also get to um, slower diffusion. But often you're fighting against relaxation. And so depending on the pulse sequence, you'll have T1 T2 relaxation during the PFG experiment. And so practically your diffusion time normally has some, some limits. Okay. Um, well, on your some... kind of static, it still looked like it was decaying. So it was not so much that you were limited by the gradient. Or is it the problem that if you have any kind of slight change in angle, you're not quite measuring the perpendicular, you, you, you'll be measuring the faster diffusion? Exactly. So in reality, the number of crystals that are perfectly perpendicular mm-hmm. to the field are zero. Um, yeah. <laughs> so even a very slight um, misalignment in the case of very fast, anisotropic, uh, highly anisotropic diffusion, the CO2 will just whiz along uh, mm-hmm. along the crystal and still give you a small displacement in Z. So yeah. it sort of appears, and initially I was very much fooled by this. Um, and and um, the, the, first day, the first analysis we published on this was inaccurate, and we had to then go and revise that. Um, because, yeah, you, you also have a significant homogeneous broadening of mm-hmm. um, CO2. So even for a single crystal, you know, there'll be a, a finite line width. So that signal sort of contaminates the signal at the true edge. So in reality, we have no evidence for this particular sample of um, any diffusion at all in, in X, Y. Okay, cool. That's, uh, yeah, interesting to the, the kind of various minor details that you have to worry about in the end. Uh, so we have I think one more question um, from Fred Perra, who asked, um, sorry if you missed it, but in xenon NMR, the xenon chemical shift is very dependent on the geometry of the pores. Is this also the case for CO2, or is it more sensitive to the surface structure? Yeah, so for xenon, it's got such a large electron cloud that um, any interaction with the surface has a very significant effect on the chemical shift. And you'll see sort of huge changes in the isotropic chemical shift for xenon um, on 29. Whereas in carbon 13 we normally find the isotropic chemical shift doesn't change very much when you've got busy absorption it's always just around about 125 ppm it only really changes when you get a chemical reaction but what is sensitive um to the, the pore structure is the anisotropy which is what i was starting to show earlier mm-hmm. well, you can see it here so the, the magnitude um, and sign of the anisotropy here depends quite a lot on how co2 um, is oriented within the pores of the material. So that's really what we're sensitive to in, in the case of, of carbon-13 and CO2. Okay. Um, 